Então, é, bom dia, bom dia a todos. Hoje a gente vai ter o seminário do professor Luiz Torres, ele é professor da Universidade do Chile, ele fala espanhol, então talvez, talvez o, o mais fácil de qualquer forma ainda seja a gente falar inglês um com o outro, eu imagino, porque é, é mais comum, né? Então, é, so I will now introduce you, Luiz, to, to the students, just in Portuguese, but uh, I will tell you later sure. on what I told you about. Sure, sure, sure. Don't worry, I, I, I understand. Uh, I cannot speak very well, but I, I understand. Yeah, that's the point with me, too. Uh, uh, normally, I can understand, but I cannot speak because I don't know what, what exactly, what, what words should I replace when I speak in, in, in Spanish. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> yeah. Bom, o professor Luiz Torres, ele, é do, ele agora trabalha no, no Departamento de Física da Universidade do Chile, mas antes ele já trabalhou na, na, na Argentina, nesse CONICET, como um pesquisador independente. É, na Alemanha, com essa bolsa do Alexander von, von Humboldt, é uma bolsa bastante prestigiosa lá, foi na Universidade de Dresden. Em Grenoble, na Itália, no Abdus Salam, que é esse centro de física teórica. Como pós, eh, primeiro como pós-doc, depois como eh, associado júnior. E ele também foi um, um dos Simons Associate no ICTP. Ele ganhou o, pre, o prêmio do ICTP em 2018. Eh, e ele, ele trabalha com, com modelos teóricos para grafeno, imagino que para nanotubos de carbono também. Yeah, for, for carbon nanotubes as well. Yeah, we actually met in a conference here in In, in Fortaleza, like 10 years ago or something. <laughs> It was a conference. I think for uh, it's, just, it's, just, it's, pity, it's a pity, but that's how things work now. <laughs> so please, Luis, uh, be welcome. You can start now. We have more or less 45 Excellent. minutes from now on. Okay. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you very much, Andre. And yes, yes, I have very good memories. Actually, I remember that conference was, I think it was 10 years ago. And it uh, was, was, was really very, very nice event. And uh, I'm, I'm, I'm very happy to, to, to connect with you now through to this. Uh, this means we, we have all learned through the pa pandemic to, to deal with, uh, with different tools. So I'm, I'm very happy to be here. Um, so please uh, feel free to interrupt me at any point. I will try to to speak uh, slowly, and if if you if you have any questions, feel free to to interrupt me. This talk is going to be about, um, as you see in the title, electron phonon interaction with a special kind of phonon modes that are called chiral phonons. I will explain what are these special phonons in two-dimensional materials. Uh, you know, my favorite material is, is, is graphene, so I, I'm always around two-dimensional materials. And um, so that's the talk of today. Um, first of all, I would like to acknowledge collaborators. This is a very, very partial list. There's more people, but uh, even from this small list, I would like to uh, thank especially Joaquin, who is, uh, did a, a master's with us and is now in, in Barcelona with Stefan. Um, Jose, who is now doing a postdoc with us and is working on these topics, and Hernan, uh, these three guys are, are the ones that are really uh, doing uh, the work uh, behind the things that I'm, I'm going to talk about today. Today I will mention mostly work I did with Joaquin and Hernan. And so thank also uh, all the, uh, the, the funding agencies that have helped us throughout the years, Uh, Universidad de Chile, from the seat here in Chile, and many others in other places um, that have helped us. Um, this is some picture of present and former uh, members of the team. Um, you see people from, from different places with different backgrounds. Some of them have background in chemistry, electrical engineering, uh, the others in, mostly in physics. This is an image from the University of Chile, the campus where, where uh, I'm working now. It's, uh, there's a very modern part that you see here uh, in this part of, of on this side of the street. On the other side, there's an older part that is also very nice. That is where the Department of Physics is, but we also use many facilities on, on the new side that is really, really beautiful place. 
um, as kind of presentation, Andre already uh, mentioned some things, but uh, I'm from Cordoba in Argentina, in the center, and uh, I moved uh, to different places uh, through the years. Uh, since 2016, I'm here at the University of Chile. Um, the topics in which uh, where I work have to do with um, mostly quantum transport, um, quantum materials, uh, two-dimensional materials, topological insulators, light matter interaction. This is what I would say as, as the main topics of my research. Um, but a few, th a few uh, weeks ago, I made an exercise. I used one of these automatized tools in the web, the signmeter.org, and uh, they took my list of publications and made a, cl a word of clouds with, uh, with the most common uh, words that appear in my publications. And, um, and, and there was a big floque inside here that has to do with, with the tools we use for, for light matter interaction. And here in different, different uh, colors, you see uh, research that is more recent in red and older in, in blue. And the funny thing is that if you start to see, you will see that uh, phonons appear now sometimes in, in or electron phonon in blue, sometimes in, in reddish. It's like a topic that has uh, accompanied me throughout the years. Um, and it's a topic where to which I always come back somehow. And what I'm, I'm going to talk about today is this. It's a story of, of a comeback to a topic after many years of not working there. Um, for the Floquet things, um, what we do is has to do a lot with uh, light matter interaction and trying to use light as a topological switch to create topological states in materials to test uh, their properties like uh, transport properties, uh, hole induced, um, uh, light induced hole effect that has been recently observing experiments many years after uh, many predictions, including some of, of our predictions. Uh, appeared these experiments in 2020 where this effect was observed. I always use, as I said, graphene as a playground. It's a kind of favorite material. And, um, and from time to time, we start poking with different uh, topics. Like, for example, a couple of few years ago, we were dealing with non emission um, uh, Hamiltonians, something that looked like very, very exotic and uh, abstract with these two people, with Victor and uh, Victor Manuel and Jose Eduardo. And uh, at that time he was a postdoc with us. Now he's a professor at the University of uh, at UNAM in Mexico. And to our big surprise, these kind of things that we were, were just trying out uh, came to have many experimental realizations in systems that went from, uh, go from quantum walks with photons, circuits, active matter, ultra cold matter. This is just to mention some of of the topics of our research. So as I mentioned, from time to time, you see here electron phonon that appears in different colors. And this is the, the topic of this uh, talk. What I will do is I will start with uh, a history of electron phonon interaction in solids. I will mention some hallmarks for this. Um, then uh, I, will, I will talk a bit, a bit about this word that appeared in the title, chirality, and the chirality of electrons and how, how important this is for electrons. And then I will turn to chiral phonons. That is something that is more recent. People were, were not um, somehow um, thinking about this until uh, a few years ago. And then I will focus on, on our work that has to do with electron phonon interaction with chir chiral phonons in two dimensional materials. So um, I, I will start from the very beginning. This is a famous. Uh, picture of the Solvay conference in 1927, the time in between two wars, and uh, all these uh, scientists meeting the, there for this uh, very well-known conference on electrons and, and photons. Um, or you can see the peculiar thing about this, uh, you can see there uh, Marie Curie, you can see Albert Einstein, you can see uh, Max Planck, uh, there's uh, Heisenberg, all, all the well-known people that founded quantum mechanics were there. And uh, soon after this, this theory, the basics, uh, the foundations of this theory were established, people immediately started to try to apply this to understand how materials uh, work. And uh, this is, a, for example, one of the projects that Heisenberg gave to, to Felix Bloch, in, in the, the tall guy in this picture. Um, 
and um, and this was the project. And Bloch, what what started doing was saying, well, let's uh, make an, a very ideal model for for solid. Let's think of a crystal, and let's try to understand how the electrons move through these uh, regular arrangements of of atoms, infinite arrangements of, of atoms in the crystal. And um, and, and as soon as people had uh, what we know now as, as block theorem, uh, theorem as, as a tool, uh, immediately you start thinking about deviations from this ideal situation where all your atoms are, are uh, sitting there fixed, like, uh, like you glued them with a very powerful glue. Uh, they, you know that they start displacing from these equilibrium positions. And uh, this displacement is essentially given by collective excitations that are the phonons these um, uh, normal modes for, for the vibrations in, in a crystal. And um, these deviations from this uh, perfect situation where all the atoms are, are standing still gives corrections to, for example, um, the, 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 the electrical properties of materials. This is a very old paper by, by Rudolf Pires, who already in 1930 was um, writing on this. Then there, there are these uh, other papers, for example, this physical review by Bridgman. Uh, and then, of course, later on, there, there came the very famous papers, like, for example, this one by John Bardeen, uh, trying to now understand aspects of, of um, superconductivity, where the interaction between the electrons and these um, uh, vibrations, these phonons, uh, becomes crucial. And um, I mentioned there uh, Rudolf Piles. Uh, here it is, you have Rudolf Pires, very young, in 1931, with uh, Heisenberg. You have uh, Felix Bloch also here uh, on the back. And, um, and this uh, person, this uh, gentleman, uh, had a crucial role in many of the things we know today about the role of electron phonon interaction in solids. One of the peculiar things that he discovered is what today we call the Pires transition. Um, the story says that uh, he was writing um, a textbook on, on, on solid state, the quantum theory of solids, this, uh, this book that you see here in the 50s. And he, while well, he was preparing um, some, some sections, some problems for the book, um, he realized that uh, of, of what today we call the Pires transition. What's the Pires transition? Essentially, um, if you take, uh, for example, a system in one dimension, take a crystal in one dimension, and, uh, and then um, you compute the band structure, for example, for a system with one orbital per side, like here, you have typically band structure that is like the one that is uh, drawn down here. The system, uh, if you have one electron per, per atom, is, is uh, it's a metal. You have all states occupied in red at zero temperature, so it's a metal. But what Pyros realized is that this system, this configuration of the system, where the system is metallic, is unstable um, against uh, very, very, uh, even very tiny distortions that double the, the periodicity of the lattice. So if I now put um, a small distortion on this system, a potential that doubles the periodicity, I can imagine that I, I bring together uh, two atoms, the other two are far apart, and so on, like this. Then you see immediately that the gaps open at the Fermi uh, level, and uh, uh, the energy of, uh, if you sum up all the energy of the electrons, the energies of the electrons, you get lower overall energy uh, thanks to this um, distortion that doubles the period of uh, the lattice. In general, of course, if, if you don't have half filling, uh, any distortion that has a, um, a wave vector that doubles uh, the Fermi wave vector, Kf, uh, produces the same uh, result. Um, what Pyros uh, realized, and he, he's telling this story very nicely in this uh, other book, More Surprises in Theoretical Physics, that appeared like uh, uh, 30, 40 years after his uh, solid state book. <clears throat> what he argues there is that um, essentially what, what, uh, what, when he saw that this was happening, he realized that, uh, well, in principle, the, although the, the electronic energy lowers, the elastic energy that you have to spend 
to have their these atoms uh, in this uh, with this distortion <coughs> increases. But the important thing is that in one dimension, the energy gain uh, that the electrons have uh, always is larger than the, en the than than the higher energy you you get because of the lattice distortion, and this uh, energy gain is goes logarithmically with uh, the displacement from uh, that that you have from this. Uh, situation where you have all the atoms equally placed. This delta is the displacement for this. So at the end, no matter how small is this displacement, if it has the correct period, then uh, you always uh, gain energy by opening a gap. And, and then this uh, situation, the right one, is more stable than the left one. In this sense, uh, one says that um, the system, this metallic phase becomes unstable at low enough temperature. If you go to low enough temperature, then you will always find the system in uh, and the insulating state, the pyrus insulator that, that you see there. And um, what happens, of course, is that this depends on temperature. If the temperature is too large, then it's not true that all the states here are occupied. You start to having some of the states up there occupied, and then your energy, this uh, improvement in the overall energy of the system vanishes, and of course, you will go to the metallic phase. So there's a critical temperature, Dc, that uh, separates between um, the metal and the insulator. What, uh, what produces this, it's very interesting. What happens is that in order to, to go from this situation on the left of the metal to the situation on the right, you have um, a, a very uh, interesting process where electrons talk to phonons. What happens is that, uh, how, how do you go from one to the other? Well, you take one phonon mode, like for example, a stretching mode in this, uh, in this system on the left. The stretching mode is a mode where, where neighboring atoms do like this, in opposite phase. And then the electrons somehow try to start conspiring to lower the energy of this mode, to lower the frequency of this mode. To do that, what they do is they form charge density waves. So they, they group forming a wave of electronic density that uh, accomplishes this task to lower the energy of uh, the frequency of this phonon mode. Then if you think I start with having some vibrations like this and I start lowering the frequency, this goes slower and slower. And at some point, um, essentially you can imagine that you get your atoms stuck at the return points of their classical trajectory. And so at the end of the day, you end up with a situation uh, like the one on the right. But it becomes a structural thing because if, if you take out the dynamics from the from the phonons, then it becomes a structural effect and then you have uh, essentially this insulator. Of course, uh, there are, uh, from the viewpoint of electrons below the critical temperature, you get this metal insulator transition. But if you look at the phonons, the phonons also get affected, as I said, the frequency uh, gets reduced close to this critical temperature. And this is called the cone anomaly for phonons. So this softening of a specific phonon mode above the critical temperature. So please, if you have any questions, feel free to, to ask in the chat. I can, I can, I can read them or, or, or interrupt me as, as you wish. And uh, the funny thing is pilots in this uh, book, uh, this more surprises in theoretical physics books, book uh, says that um, this instability came to him as a surprise. And uh, and he thought at that moment that it was not worth publishing the argument because um, um, he thought somehow that, that it made no sense. There were no one dimensional materials. And so this this made no, no sense. And, uh, and he didn't publish it. He just put some comment in the book uh, without uh, many of the calculations that he did. Uh, but this came back a uh, long time um, later uh, with uh, the topic of conducting polymers, for which these three gentlemen here received the Nobel Prize in Chemistry in 2000. Um, uh, Shirakawa, McDermott, and Alan Heger, they received the Nobel Prize for this. And uh, the point was that many people were looking for for many ways to, uh, to, to exploit polymers, they realized that polymers that are largely one dimensional objects uh, were not metallic, were typically uh, 
insulating. And this is because of the pilot's mechanism. And uh, these people found different ways to uh, get uh, metallic conducting polymers. And for this, they received the Nobel Prize. And so the, all this story from the pilot's transition came back immediately. And there are many other examples where electron phonon interaction is crucial. Um, one of them is uh, the story of Cooper pairs and superconductivity. Uh, you, you have here these three gentlemen, John Bardeen, uh, Leon Cooper, and Robert Schiffer, in the correct order. These are the B, the C, and the S of the BCS theory. And um, essentially, the idea in this theory is that um, if you have uh, electrons moving through a special material, then you may have that the passage of one electron leaves somehow uh, um, distortion in the lattice, as you see in this scheme, uh, that uh, uh, serves as, as a mediator for an interaction with the second electron that comes up, out, uh, up uh, later. And so at the end of the day, you have pairs of electrons, the so-called Cooper pairs, that are glued by this electron phonon interaction and that give rise to um, a family of superconductors. Um, more or less at the same time, uh, there were some very interesting theories by this gentleman, uh, Herbert Froehlich, um, who had very, very interesting visions and ideas about how uh, electrons and phonons interact and could give rise to, to different uh, phenomena. Uh, he was thinking about superconductivity in one dimension, in one famous paper, and then he had some some very um, how to say puzzling uh, papers, very interesting papers, uh, where essentially he suggested the possibility of having some kind of, uh, of Bose uh, Einstein condensation in phonon wave vector space, and so on. So this just to to name some of the of the funding figures uh, of, uh, of of this of this field. Let's go now uh, to uh, the second point I mentioned at the beginning of the talk, that is chirality. Uh, essentially, we exist thanks to the chirality uh, uh, in the asymmetry of life. Many of the, most of the molecules of life are, are, are chiral. What we mean by chiral? Well, um, an object that cannot be superimposed on its mirror image it's called chiral, like, like the hands. I cannot superimpose one hand over the, the other perfectly. You see that there's there's a kind of mismatch. And uh, this is, so that's why uh, hand is called a chiral object. Uh, but for example, this flask you see here can be superimposed with its mirror image. And then you say that this is an achiral object. So this property is called chirality. And, um, and for the case of electrons, this has been very extensively studied and exploited over the last decades. Um, there are many, many examples like electronics, the chiral edge states you have in the quantum Hall effects and many others. Uh, for electronics, for example, if you get the dispersion relation of the electrons for a very simple model of electrons for electrons in graphene, then you have something like this. This is energy as a function of, of wave vector and you have two dimensional space for the wave vector because it's a two dimensional material. The wave vectors are the labels for the states in the system. And then uh, you can see that there are two inequivalent uh, points where this uh, conduction and balance bands meet. And um, the dispersion relation around these points is, is a cone. It's, uh, it's, it's what gives a lot of interesting properties to graphene. But interestingly, if you look at the dispersion relation on the other uh, um, non-equivalent uh, K point, these points where, where the but conduction balance bands uh, meet, you see that uh, there's also a cone, but it has a different property. If you look at the properties of the eigenstates, you see that you have also a kind of chirality. Uh, in one case, um, what's called the pseudo spin that has to do with this um, degree of freedom in the lattice points in different directions for one cone and the other for one Bailey and the other, as people call it. And so um, this has also embedded a, a chiral property that is the basics for many of the things people do in what uh, is called Baileytronics or trying to exploit this Bailey degree of freedom. Um, if we go to the uh, integer quantum Hall effect, 
that is uh, the effect that appears when you have a 2D, 2D electron gas, you have a perpendicular magnetic field, you see that the bulk of the system becomes an insulator and the edges uh, host uh, states that propagate in a special way. Um, the states on one edge propagate in one direction, in the opposite edge propagate in the opposite direction. So at the end of the day, you have um, states that also are called chiral because in one edge you have this propagation in one direction, in the other in the opposite. So they have also chiral property. What about phonons? For electrons, there are, I could talk an hour more about different examples where chirality plays a very important role. What about phonons? Phonons, as I said, are these collective um, vibrations of the system, these collective modes of uh, vibration. If you have graphene, you start having many uh, normal modes for vibrations. This is, for example, a stretching mode where neighboring atoms move in opposite phase. And this is uh, what one would call a non-chiral mode. Why? Because if you if you just uh, you, you see that there's no preferred direction for, for movement. Uh, in one phase they move here like this and a uh, moment later they move in the opposite direction. So there's no preferential direction. This is called the non-chiral mode. And um, one could try to imagine a more interesting dance for these uh, electrons. Uh, for the, for these uh, for these atoms, and uh, this is what uh, Li Fasang and Tian Niu uh, started to imagine back in 2015. They realized that if you break uh, inversion symmetry in two-dimensional materials, then uh, you can somehow get modes where you have a chirality. So you have a net. Uh, movement that goes in one direction, not in the other. Like, for example, having these A-type uh, atoms here that are in blue moving uh, in circles in one direction and not in the other, and the B-type atoms moving in the opposite. So at the end, this this movement is, is a chiral movement. And uh, normally you, you don't even think about this because what happens is that um, the uh, the motion in one, in one direction in the opposite uh, have the same um, frequency. And so any combination, you can combine them as to have an achiral uh, uh, mode. But uh, thanks to the breaking of inversion symmetry, you can lift the degeneracy between uh, having this motion in one direction in the opposite, and then you can separate these modes uh, and have uh, separate uh, modes that are really very interesting. I will, I will try to show, uh, I don't know if it will, no, it will not work. Okay, so so essentially what, what you can imagine is, is, uh, is this, you have the blue atoms that move uh, in one direction and the red atoms that move in the opposite. So if you think that, for example, my head is a carbon atom and I am I'm coordinated with three carbon atoms, one down and two up, like this at 120 degrees, then you can imagine that, that that I start moving in one direction like this and not in the other one. And if I go to the next atom, I move in the opposite direction. So this is this is the dance, the, the more interesting dance that these uh, atoms are, are making. So a um, few years later, uh, this uh, team here uh, observed these chiral phonons in a monolayer tungsten diselenide, another two-dimensional material that has broken inversion symmetry, they managed to observe this. And then a lot of interest started to appear because you start to think, wow, these phonon modes that you will not find most likely in your solid state textbooks. Um, because I, I don't know, all, all the examples I have seen in the textbooks are, are achiral modes. Um, you, you start thinking, wow, what about these chiral phonons? What do they do to different things? Uh, thermal conductivity stuff, you can start thinking um, if, if there, there, there has been so much interest in chiral properties for electrons, now having these symphonons could open the doors for completely new things. And uh, effectively, a lot of people started thinking about this. Uh, some people, for example, think that chiral phonons could have a very important role in the pseudo gap phase of the cuprates of uh, superconductors. Um, recently, there has been some very interesting paper where they uh, showed the possibility of having magnetic control of chiral phonons in, in special material. 
and um, and so that's uh, that's uh, uh, something that is started is starting to interest more and more and more people. And so uh, for these modes, I'm I'm uh, these modes occur uh, independently of the temperature of the system. You can go very low, and you have just normal modes that are are not degenerate anymore and have chirality. And so all these people are trying to understand the the chirality of these of these modes and their effects. One of our questions was if these uh, modes could uh, lead to unusual effects through their interaction with electrons. They, could they somehow, through the interaction, uh, electron phonon interaction, these phonons imprint some kind of chiral property on, on the electrons, for example? This is something that we're uh, wondering. Uh, you know, we have um, things, uh, um, ingredients such as magnetic fields, spin orbit interaction, that all in, uh, introduce very important, interesting effects. And now the question is, what happens with the interaction between electrons and chiral phonons? Can we have some um, uh, time reversal symmetry breaking uh, deriving from this interaction that, that brings new effects? And for example, one could uh, try to imagine if we could, could get new hybrid electron phonon states of matter, similar to the things that we were studying with light, you could get a hybrid uh, electron photon states of matter that can be observed today in the lab. Uh, can we get here new electron photon states of matter? This is a question. Uh, essentially, what I'm thinking is states that are not now uh, uh, simple electronic states, but I, we, you also have uh, the degree of freedom of phonons. So if you think of states, you have now direct products of the electronic states and phonon states, and you could immediately have uh, superpositions of these uh, states, and you could think of doing kind of uh, QED-like physics, but now with phonons instead of photons uh, or, or light. There are a lot of uh, people interested in this now, uh, people that are trying to, 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 to do somehow uh, these kind of things. And, uh, and so this is more or less to give a motivation for, for the area. Um, Let's let's go to to our results. I will I will show something very simple. What I, what we did was to think of the system. Since there were no studies of electron phonon interactions with this type of phonons, we said let's let's uh, do something very simple. Let's think of a two dimensional material like graphene, where we have some inversion symmetry breaking that could be introduced, for example, through a substrate. Um, and then. Let's think of uh, having an electronic term, a phonon term, and an electron phonon interaction term. For the electrons, we could take a simple uh, tight binding model, a single uh, orbital per site. And, um, and for the phonons, we could do the simplest thing that is to try to isolate a single of these chiral modes and check uh, their effect through the interaction with electrons on, on, the, on, on the properties of the system. Uh, the electron phonon interaction term uh, comes from the fact that uh, you, you can think that the hopping between two sides uh, is tied to uh, this distance uh, that you have between, between the two localized orbitals. And so the larger the distance, the hopping should decrease and so on. And now if you think that the positions are changing, uh, if you think semi-classically, you can think that they are changing in time, it's clear that this change of the positions in time will produce a change in the hoppings. So this will give rise to the electron phonon interaction term. Essentially, you have to parameterize uh, the motion produced by, by the phonons on the on this interatomic, uh, the change in this interatomic distance. And then you can come out with the Hamiltonian for the electron phonon interaction term that, well, it may look a bit complicated, but, but it's, it's not so much as, as it looks like. Once you have all these three terms, um, we have to solve the system for this full problem. Usually the problem of, of this type of interactions might be complicated, but um, here we are going to try to unveil effects that need to go beyond perturbation theory. So we need a non-perturbative solution. Moreover, since the frequency of the phonons uh, might be important, it's not something that we can neglect 
And so the phone on energy as well, it's something that cannot be neglected, ne ne neglecting it. We have to go to a non-adiabatic regime. Therefore, we need non-adiabatic and non-perturbative solution for uh, this problem. And for this, we use essentially this, um, the technique um, mentioned in these two papers that we also use later in, in many different other papers. Essentially, uh, the technique allows you to, to solve, to get this non-perturbative and non-adiabatic solution. It's not very complicated. What you do is you write the problem in um, a basis for the folk uh, states of the system where you have electrons and uh, phonons. And, uh, and then the problem becomes uh, very, very uh, like a, a non-interacting problem, but in a higher dimension. So it resembles a lot to what you do in Floquet theory. Uh, but now for, for phonons and with some, some differences. What um, we realized uh, when analyzing this problem of the interactions together with Joaquin and Arnan is that um, these phonons produce a very interesting effect. They, they try to gap uh, one of the cones at half the phonon energy, uh, h bar omega over 2, um, this, these are different colors correspond to different values of um, the phonon number. Here you have zero phonons, here you have one phonon. So you see that one of the cones, of the two equivalent cones, will get uh, gapped, the other not. Uh, and, and then when you go to, the, to different phonon states, this, this changes. So at the end of the day, what you will have is that one of the cones is effectively gapped, the other remains ungapped. And, um, and when you look at the finite system where you have edges, we see that on top of this background of states, because uh, here this, you have a supercell associated to this phone. So at the end of the day, these two cones um, collapse on, on the same. So the background that you see in color here, this density of states corresponds to the ungapped cone that you have on the back. And the cone that is gapped inside hosts these two lines that you see here that are edge states. So, so these two lines correspond to states that propagate to, through the edge. Um, you can see in these probabilities here for these uh, states as a function of position, you see that they are localized on the edges of your ribbon. And um, so you have translation and symmetry in this direction. You have states that propagate in the edges. And the interesting thing is that these two states propagate along the same direction. They are co-propagating. So in contrast with the states that, for example, you have in, this is for a zigzag ribbon. In contrast to the states you have for uh, the, the quantum hole effect that I mentioned, where the, the states are chiral, you have propagation in one direction on one edge and the opposite on the other. These are co-propagating, and uh, which is very very weird. And these are hybrid electron phonon states of matter. Uh, as I said, there, there has been some discussion over the last years about the possibility of having. Uh, not only chiral edge states, as I mentioned, for the quantum hole effect, or helical states where you have counter-propagating counter states but with opposite spin as the, in the quantum spin hole. There's also a family of uh, systems that host anti-chiral states or co-propagating edge states. So you have edge states that propagate in the same direction. They were proposed some time ago. We're having something similar to this, but now stemming from electron phonon interaction. The interesting thing about uh, these uh, states is that uh, these edge states is that they, they can be written more or less like this schematically. You have uh, an electronic part for a state that belongs to one uh, k-point, to one of these Baileys or cones, um, direct product with a state with zero phonons, plus a state that is uh, around uh, the other cone, K minus, or the, the other Bailey, direct product, product of the state with one phonon. So at the end of the day, you see that you cannot separate the electronic and, and phonon parts of these uh, states. Uh, they are entangled states. So you have the, the Bailey is locked to the phonon state. So if, I, if, if you happen to measure the electronic part and you realize that it's in a given Bailey, then immediately you will know the phonon part of the state. So they are entangled states that are uh, very uh, interesting. Um, there's still a lot to do to try to think how to use them, how to make 
uh, these states more useful for many things. And this is uh, stuff that we are doing with uh, with uh, Jose um, Meja and Hernan Calvo. Uh, at the moment, uh, we hope to have a, a preprint soon on, on these um, new things. Um, in, in our previous study, we also checked uh, if there is uh, some degree of robustness to imperfections or not and how this works. Uh, there's, there's uh, at the end, a lot really uh, to do with this sort of systems. Um, so I will we'll mention some final remarks and then, and then some uh, per perspectives for the future. So uh, I showed you a kind of tip of the iceberg introduction to this uh, world of electron phonon interaction effects in solids. Um, I presented some uh, very briefly some new results on non-perturbative and non-adiabatic effects of the interaction between electrons in chiral phonons in two-dimensional materials. Uh, this could apply, for example, for graphene on hexagonal boron nitride, where the substrate introduces uh, um, the symmetry breaking that is necessary in the lattice. And I showed you how this interaction leads to a hybrid co-propagating electron phonon states of matter. And uh, as future work, we are thinking of uh, uh, think of new ways to produce more useful electron phonon st entangled states. Uh, try to think of how to eventually detect these electron phonon entangled states. And so we hope that this uh, will, will bring uh, new surprises and new, new physics. And so I'm, I think I'm almost right in the 45 minutes. So thank you very much for, for your attention. I'm, I'm open to questions, doubts, anything. Hi. So Thank you very much for the very interesting talk. So I will now open the session for questions and comments. There is already one question here by João yes. Vitor Pereira de Souza. Uh, ah, yeah, yeah, I see it. It will appear there on the screen. So Great. you see that? It's in Portuguese, but I guess you can understand a little bit. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Wow, this is great. Flash, yes. How are you flashing? So, uh, uh, OK. Um, oh. Ah, OK. He's, now, he's, Oh, your connection. Can you hear me? I'm not sure if it's my connection or your. Yeah, I, I'm not sure. Your connection. That's. I, I will. I will try to. I will try to to answer. I I, I saw the question now. Um, so I think that he is asking uh, for the Cooper pairs up here. Like, like here. Um, okay. Uh, here, uh, for, for, for superconductivity, for this uh, BCS theory, uh, people think uh, you need a mechanism. Usually, the, the interaction between electrons tends to be repulsive because you have an electrostatic component that is repulsive. So now the question is how uh, it comes that you can pair electrons when, when the interaction is repulsive. You, you, you should not. But what uh, this uh, gentleman um, found, uh, Leon Cooper, was that um, you could make pairs thanks to some intermediary uh, interaction like electron phonons. So you think that one electron interacts with the vibrations and produces a distortion. And through this distortion, uh, it may interact with a second electron. And this interaction is uh, attractive. And so this is what helps to produce the, um, the Cooper pairs. So at the end of the day, uh, the phonons are, are, you have these phonons all the time in the background, and they help, help as a kind of glue for, for bringing a positive interaction between these electrons. So that's, uh, that's the idea. I don't know if this solves the question. Yeah, yeah, I think it answers the question. Uh, well, actually, my camera now got a, a bit of a problem, so sorry about that. But uh, no, no problem. <laughs> but you still hear me, right? Okay. Yes. Yes. Perfect. So then, uh, uh, well, actually, if you see, there are other mechanisms. Also, people have been thinking about of this uh, to produce this electron-electron uh, attraction. But like, it's, it needs to be. I think it needs to be always through some other interaction. Like, let's say it's electrons and phonons, or anything else that can dress the electron in a way that it will attract each other. That's how this uh, this BCS theory works. But the the, uh, the it's a very successful theory. So, 
Yes. Uh, I know that for, for high temperature superconductors, it doesn't work so well, but I mean, it was a very strong break breakthrough in the, in the theory for superconductivity when they learned that that, that could be the, the, the issue. And actually, if you look at this isotope effect, that yes. also kind of confirmed that, which is uh, just for yes. João Vitor who asked it. Uh, uh, actually, maybe I should answer a little bit in Portuguese too. I'm not sure if he's following everything, but então, pra, só para explicar, então, o que acontece é que nessa interação entre é, dois elétrons, na supercondutividade, os dois elétrons precisam estar presos né, um com o outro, então eles precisam atrair de alguma forma. Então, o que acontece é que é, essa interação atrativa você só consegue se você colocar algum tipo de nuvem ao redor do elétron, alguma coisa que mexa com, com o formato do elétron de alguma forma, entendeu? Tipo de, com a interação entre os dois elétrons. E aí, nesse caso o que está mexendo aí com a interação entre os elétrons é o fóton, né? Então, isso é um mecanismo um dos mais conhecidos para produzir supercondutividade, sabe? Então, isso é o que chama de teoria de BCS. Mas é isso, quando você está na temperatura crítica, os fônons, a interação elétron fóton é, so, é tão forte que, que é, ela faz com que elétrons acabem interagindo um com o outro de forma atrativa e isso é o que começa a supercondutividade. Isso. Né? Uh, yes. Se tiverem mais perguntas aí, podem escrever aí no chat, aí eu mostro aqui, pro, eu clico aqui e mostro para o professor Luiz. And I also have one more question, which is, you said that uh, these uh, chiral phonons, they were observed first in, in molybdenum disulfide, I think, yes. or in one of these transition metal dicalcogenides? It's, it's, it's one layer tungsten diselenide. Tungsten diselenide, okay. So then... I would guess that that's because you need a, a honeycomb lattice, but the the sub lattices should be different from each other, right? Exactly, exactly. You need yes, this but then, making. But then why not boron nitride? Because boron nitride is already like that, right? Or silicon yes. carbide is also like that. Yes. yes, yes, it should it should work in principle in all these materials, but people yeah. started to, to you know uh, the, I, I guess the problem is that you need uh, for this. Um, symmetry breaking to be strong enough so that uh, you you split the degeneracy between the, the modes moving in one direction and the other. And, uh, and in order to have a sizable splitting, uh, probably you need a larger uh, um, term and, and I don't know the details, but, but uh, I guess that, for example, uh, uh, boron nitride should work because it's, it's very different. And, and, uh, and, and I hope, I think that, that in the next few years, we'll start seeing this more and more frequently. There will be more and more experiments. Yeah, I also guess so, because now the, the, it may be that people didn't look for that before, I think. So exactly. now doors are open that people now can see these kind of chiral phonons and look for these kind of phonons in, in other uh, systems. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think it's, it's promising indeed. Because you said that, for example, you could put the, the chiral, uh, the topological state that you mentioned, you you said that you could do that with graphene on top of boron nitride, but it could also be on silicon carbide, I guess, because I saw some other papers where they they, they have graphene already on top of silicon carbide because of some, uh, 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 some fabrication procedure. Sometimes yes. they make a kind of annealing that pr to produce graphene and that already gives you some silicon carbide on the bottom of graphene and sometimes they open some gaps in the graphene layer of like let's say 100 milli electron volts or something and that that's, will that's be fun. because of this break yeah. and and the question uh the, the lattices are are almost commensurate right like in for example yes example, exactly yeah so then, that's then what you need then if it's larger it's even better and and look i think um these phonons uh, thinking about i i, I was i was Remembering when, when I visited you in, in Fortaleza, uh, you have all these, um, I have not seen uh, Raman experiments that I remember on. Yeah, on actually here we, we, the group, there is a group here who does a lot of Raman. They also yes. do some Raman on high pressures and so on. This yes, is the group yes. of uh, Paulo de Tarso yes. and Carlos William. I think Carlos William is also here in the, in the audience and uh, Gomes, Antonio Gomes. Yes, yes. Uh, yes I think yes. Eduardo Bede working in that group too. I'm not sure. Now I, I've been talking to him uh, a lot about theory, but I'm not sure if he's still doing uh, experiments also on that. But 
we we have a strong group. Uh, uh, Prof Professor Ayala also works on. on yeah, yeah, I remember. Group. I remember. I visited you. Uh, I visited the group when when I went for this conference. They they showed me some experiments that for me were like magic. You know, these experiments were yeah. pressure pressure in systems. They showed yes. me how they did these things. It was it was it was amazing. And, yeah, uh, yeah. So it's so William is commenting here that Professor Ayala also works on that. I don't know if you met him here. So they, they have a very strong group on Raman spectroscopy here. Yeah, so. uh, it's very, very interesting. Uh, so, but so we, what we maybe what we need, but maybe William could mention on that or, or somebody else who is from the group. What we need to measure this kind of stuff would be more like uh, maybe clean samples because this is it may be challenging to, to observe yes. that, right? Yes. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yes. And then I'm, I'm sure that there are difficulties, but but I, I guess that things will start appearing because imagine yeah. many materials where this inversion were, was broken and people didn't realize that you had this mo this movement with chirality. Suddenly, if the the phonons start imprinting some effect to the electrons, one could have been observing stuff that that looked weird. And now with this new understanding of, oh, look, there are chiral phonons, perhaps many things will have to be re-examined and people will have to think about. Yeah, and it yeah, was, yeah. was funny yeah. because, uh, you know, I, I was teaching many times uh, solid state physics. And the moment when I saw that, wow, now these modes exist, I said, oh, I have to rethink how, uh, because in the yeah. textbooks, you never see a chiral mode. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So that's, that's, and that's now, There is a question here from Nayuson Vasconcelos, so if, uh, yeah. So then the question is, if you have been studying something related to the formation of self-trapped self excitons in 2D semiconductors. Interesting, no, no, we, ha we have not done any work along that direction, but it's it's interesting. There There's a lot of stuff going on, uh, on now in this field with excitons, and a lot of people thinking about, uh, I don't know, how to, yeah. to do, interesting stuff with excitons so so it's 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 a promising topic but we'll, but we have not done yeah i know that to... there is some co connection between excitons and and phonons in the sense that sometimes when you have uh, when you have phonons they will change the, the let me remember how it was the connection ah it was more like if you have excitons, excitons is a kind of a light inducing or light induced transition or light emission transition. But most, and so, most, most of the time you think of, you, you form an electron hole pair. Yeah, exactly. That's thanks, thanks to, for example, light. But you can think that instead of using light, you could use phonons. Yeah, yeah. In but in, then in, in that case, it's possible that the spot that you have the light formed by the excitons there, that spot will get hotter because you have more excitons there. And then this temperature dependence will uh, change the phonons in that region. And then the phonons will interact with the excitons again. And then you'll have this kind of uh, iterative procedure where you have like, it, this will lead to something like a kind of a ring shaped, as I understand, I read recently about uh, some words like that where you can find that exciton phonon interactions lead to some kind of a ring-shaped uh, light emission because of that, because you have uh, a big exciton spot, then a lot of light, but well, then it, it warms up that region, then there is a lot of phonons, then the phonons destroy the exitons there, and then this, will, wow. this is what, what happens there. Well, that's ah, cool. Now, uh, William is also, uh, it, it, William Pascual is now mentioning oh, that. Yeah, yeah. You can observe this thing in, in these halide perovskites also. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. Interesting. But it's a it's a, a, a very interesting topic too, and there are some some connections between like uh, phonon physics and exciton physics too. Yes, yes. I, I come more from uh, uh, during the last years we were working a lot with light matter interaction, and, and as I said, somehow I, I came back to this topic that where I have not been working for a very long time. And yeah. um, and so I'm, I'm always thinking in mostly light matter things. And uh, there, there's a lot of promise with, with electrons and with excitons. Yeah. 
Well, actually, in light matter interactions, you can also talk about like uh, for forgetting about the phone, the, the excitons. You can still talk about uh, phonon polaritons, right? Yes. So yes. 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 In yes. that case, you would have something like chiral phonon polaritons, which could be something interesting to think about. <laughs> It's interesting. Yeah. It's interesting. Uh, I think that there are there are ton of combinations. Uh, every direction you look with this stuff, there's something. Um, yeah. Because it, it's like I don't know. As I said, uh, one has so imprinted these examples where the modes are achiral that suddenly the moment when you put this ingredient, new yeah. things start to come out. Yeah. yeah. Great. So, bom, tem, se tiver mais alguma pergunta, podem anotar aí na, no chat. I'm going to wait a little bit more for more questions, if students or, or anyone in the audience want to, to ask a little bit uh, uh, something else. Uh, just... Or you feel free to, to, to send an email if you have also more, more any, anyone who yeah. wants to clarify anything, whatever, feel free. Um, yeah. On the, on the web and Feel free to, to write. In your group there in Chile, do you also do phonon calculations with ab initio procedures? Or because the way no, you are doing now is more like a type binding model, right? Yeah, it's a type binding model, and so we take the simple phonon modes from uh, from uh, yeah. No, I'm asking because that's how I work too. So, <laughs> but I mean, sometimes I need some some DFT people for like input parameters, and then we. we we are always uh, we always need to ask for somebody else to do it. They, they, That's they, why they I always ask that. you have the same problem now. So. Yeah, yeah, make the I do have that problem. And this is uh, as well a reason for going to these very simple models because it's not that yeah. complicated to solve uh, for the modes. Yeah. These these systems yeah. are simple. As soon as you have uh, more orbitals or whatever, it, it gets gets done. Yeah. But at least in, in my group now we are getting better like we are having more and more students going with uh, uh, doing the, the calculations in initial level and so on so that we can uh, have good. some help from the students for that but uh, for for some time i had to always to 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 talk to somebody else to ask for the for this kind of calculation yeah, yeah, yeah we, to get so then, then you, if you need also some collaborators so you can just feel free to ask to some of our students to to do that and then we sure can give sure, you some sure. Input if you need. sure very very nice okay very it looks nice. Like, yeah it looks like there are no other questions right now so quem quem tiver mais perguntas então eu vou já vou encerrar então a transmissão e quem tiver mais perguntas pode me mandar um e-mail ou mandar um e-mail para o seu Luiz Torres também então, uh, so I'd like to thank you again for the opportunity to, to see you. your presentation alive like that. <laughs> so thanks feel free to, 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 to visit anytime and then to contact. Yeah, thanks. The same, the same. Let's let's keep in touch. Thanks. Great to see yeah. you. Okay, great to see you again. Yeah. Bye. Até mais, pessoal. Bom dia. Tchau. Bom dia.